Hey folks, Matt Colville here. What is going on? It has been many moons since last we spoke and much has changed. Big things, little things. The dice are still the same. But what they do has changed quite dramatically. That's a real word. It means drastically and dramatically. Dramatically. Don't bother looking that up. Uh, just, just trust me. And hey everybody, we had our first official playtest using our new proprietary VTT. Our own virtual tabletop, thanks to our partners at DM Hub. It is amazing. They can implement our rules faster than we can design them, which is very nice. I just thought y'all would like to know the VTT is real. It is happening. You can already make a character. Well, you can't. We can make characters, pick an ancestry, kit, class, initiative works, and just everything. It is amazing. I can't wait for y'all to get your hands on it. In the meantime, yes, we have monkeyed with the dice and how they work. Some of you will really like it. Some of you will hate it. And some of you will be like, eh, we'll see. I'm going to explain how it works and more importantly, why it works the way it does. But before we get stuck in, I want to let you all know that our friends at Trenchworks are making a big box of goblins. We will talk more about this at the end of the video. They are not paying us for this. We just like them and want them to succeed. So go check it out. Meanwhile, here at MCDM, we've been working hard on our new RPG. If it seems like progress has slowed, that's fair. But one of the things we intended to do if we funded was staff up, hire new people, not a lot of new people like like three new people. Actually, us hiring three people is a lot. But that is a lot of people for us. And I made the decision that we should prioritize hiring because the sooner we figure out who these people are and get them on board, the sooner they can help us get this game done. And we are doing that. That is working. This is not a call for applications. Our contact list is plenty long on its own. I just thought you should know we haven't been idle. Far from it. But hiring is a process and, and one you need to take seriously. And we do take it seriously. And we've made really good progress. But we didn't stop working on the game, by no means. A lot of stuff has changed since last we spoke. It is basically impossible to catalog every little twist and turn we've gone through in these videos. But that's what the Patreon is for. The patrons get to follow all this stuff, so they already know all this. In fact, the patrons have already played the game. That's right, we sent out the first Patreon packet back in December. Holy shit, it's been three months? Yeah, just about, yeah. We gave the patrons about a month to play the game and fill out the survey. Now, a month isn't really that long. As you probably know, it takes time to organize everybody's schedules. But in spite of this, we got tons of great feedback. People really played the game. We're not going to go into all the sordid details about what we learned. We did a whole Patreon post about that. Spoilers. It was a lot. But in general, people were very happy with the game they played. Now, we know. People get excited for all sorts of reasons, and you can't really tell if a game is good just from one test like this. One session or, or even one adventure isn't enough. You can tell if it's bad, absolutely, but people will give a game a good grade just because it's new and not obviously broken. People will give a game a good review just because they're excited to be part of the playtest. So one of the things we do is we sort of read between the lines and we look for feedback where we can tell Yes, that is a problem. No one else is complaining about this, but that one person is making a really good point about what this will feel like after weeks or months. Remember, we use feedback to inform development. The feedback is not in charge for a lot of reasons, including people do not all agree about which parts of the game are good or fun or even comprehensible. <laughs> I've written a lot of rule books. I've read a lot of rule books and I think it is basically impossible to write a rule book that literally everyone understands perfectly the first time they read it. Sometimes you need to play the game a few times before a rule finally makes sense. It's weird, but that's the way it is. Basically, the rule book is the map and as we have discussed, the map is not the territory. Anyway, the feedback was wide ranging, but for this video, we're just talking about the core 2D6 plus X, usually plus two die roll. Lots of people, including us, challenged the idea of everyone always adding the same plus X to the roll. We talked about that a lot. Why not just cut that plus X? Well, th this isn't a video about that, but the shorthand answers are player psychology and math. Rolling a two on 2D6 feels worse than rolling a two when you know you get to add plus two or whatever. Also, that plus X gives us a little cushion that makes the math work better for rolls with a penalty. So. What did folks like about the old die roll? Well, they liked rolling 2d6. Feels good. Sure, folks would like lots of different die rolls, but most people reported that they liked knowing everything they did was just roll 2d6. This may surprise you, but a lot of folks don't enjoy fishing for a specific polyhedral in their ginormous dice bag. They like knowing it's my turn, grab my attack dice, which are always the same. 
So yeah, we could go with 2d8 or 3d6, and folks would probably like that. But the point I'm making is that 2d6 just felt good to folks, and we pay attention to that stuff. No one was really complaining about 2d6. Folks liked the crit. That is pretty much a universal positive. Getting an extra action, as opposed to just bonus damage, gives the players way more opportunities to do cool stuff, including strategize about what they should do, and that furthers the sense of teamwork. No one misses the attack roll. <laughs> Huge surprise. This is one of those things I think we already knew just from our own internal testing, but it's nice knowing that everyone else feels the same way. Folks really, really did not like everybody basically doing the same damage. Now that automatically is a problem. They like rolling 2d6 for various reasons. They don't like that everyone is doing the same damage. Even a little kobold, 2d6? It's a problem d20 doesn't have because d20 splits the difference. The attack die, always the same. That's nice. People like knowing what is expected of them on their turn. Oh, it's my turn. I don't even know what I'm gonna do yet, but I know I need my d20. It's part of the ritual, right? It's my turn, grab the d20. I'm gonna say this again because it is important. People like knowing what is expected of them. Now, we cut the d20 attack roll for a lot of reasons, and instead we have 2d6. But that 2d6 is a damage roll. So this is the tension. This is the problem we spent weeks trying to solve. People like knowing what's expected of them, and we like that. So on your turn, you should know which dice to grab. And we like 2d6 because it gives us a nice spread. Your mom gives us, shut up. A single damage die, like, like a d8? you are just as likely to roll a one as an eight, even though one of these results is eight times greater than the other. Surely that means it should at least be a little less likely to come up. And from this, we get the swinginess that I believe contributes to slog. And that's why we went with at least two dice. One die, the best result is just as likely as the worst. Two or more dice, well, now the extreme results have the most unlikely outcomes. And this is good, we think. So remember when I said everybody liked the 2d6 and you thought, well, they would like 3d6 or 2d10? Yes, we know. But it doesn't matter which dice everyone's rolling, even if it was 3d6 or 2d12. It doesn't matter what the damage roll is. If everyone's rolling those dice, even tiny kobold, well, that is stupid. It's just as stupid as the linear results of a single die. So everyone rolling the same dice, yes, we like that. We like knowing what is expected of us on our turn. No attack die, we like that. We do not like the, do I get to take a turn die? Everyone doing the same damage? That's dumb. It feels pretty insolvable. Unsolvable, inalienable, unalienable. We knew this could be a problem, but we optimistically thought that kits, which tell you which weapons your character can use, would let us differentiate between heroes. Heavy weapon kit means you're rolling 2d6 plus a lot. A light weapon kit means 2d6 plus a little. But it wasn't enough. We want to support lots of different kinds of heroes, and doing it all just by adding different bonuses to 2d6 wasn't working. We needed bigger and bigger damage bonuses just to differentiate all the different kinds of weapons and heroes, and at that point, it's not that random anymore. 15 damage plus 2d6? The 2d6 just becomes an afterthought. We tried a version of the game where every attack used a different damage die, like a, a d8 for medium weapons and a, a d6 for psionic powers but it made everything worse. For all the reasons I said, rolling a one on a 1d8 felt really bad when it was the only thing you did on your turn. Worse than rolling two on 2d6 for reasons that are entirely down to player psychology. And we got the crazy swinginess back that we thought we'd resolved. Really, the problem as I see it was, we threw out the attack roll and went with 2d6. And those two different things became conflated in our or at least my mind. We were so excited by how well no attack roll worked that we sort of assumed we could make 2d6 damage work. So it seemed like we had something and could move on. But testing showed the truth. Everyone loved no attack roll. They liked knowing which dice to roll in their turn. They do not love everybody basically does the same damage. They liked the crit on a 12. We thought about tons of other crit options and we tested several of them. They all had flaws, including just, this feels weird. We talked about throwing out the crit, but people love the crit. James and I met and we talked all this out and we could not think of a good solution. The real problem, the fundamental problem was, how do we let everybody roll 2d6, keep the crit on a 12, and differentiate damage rolls? Have our cake and eat it too. James got there before me. I wrote a long message in our Discord laying out all of the above, just trying to define the problem and sum over everything we knew and had learned. I woke up the next morning to an equally long message from James in which he proposed the following. Your roll, your 2d6 plus x roll, 
is the input to a chart. And the chart tells you what happens. Different weapons, different heroes, means different charts. Same role, infinite variety of results. You, hearing this, are probably imagining something way more complicated than what James was proposing. I immediately, and with undisguised glee, shouted, Like Rollmaster? An RPG I quite liked. But I knew he didn't mean that. He referenced another indie RPG, Apocalypse World, that has a mechanic like this. He wasn't proposing we use that mechanic. He didn't think it would work for our game, but it was an example of an RPG that did something like this, and therefore could serve as proof of concept that the idea is not fundamentally flawed in some way. Might not be right for us, but could work. By the end of his post, you could see him working out as he went, he had refined the idea down to the following. This is a sample heroic ability. You can see the ability has a name, it's got keywords, it tells you it's a psionic power, so you know it's a talent ability, it's got range, what the legal targets are, and then you can see there's the power chart. It's got three results, they all have three results, and the differences are just how much damage you do. And then, regardless of what you get, you get an effect, which is push people back for concussive slam. James was proposing every combat ability your character has, so not general abilities like a talent's telepathy, would include a chart like this. We would all be rolling the same 2d6, but we could all have very different characters with very different weapons and therefore different and appropriately different damage results. Under this model, your choice of kit would modify your damage on this chart. This solved all our problems. Now, you might not recognize this. James didn't, but I did. This is the same idea from one of my favorite beer and pretzel games, Epic Spell Battles, a.k.a. Epic Spell Wars of the Battle Wizards Duel at Skullfire Mountain. It's a card game where you build spells out of up to three cards from your hand. Each spell has a subject, a quality, and a destination. You can use these in any combination to create unique, I mean, not literally unique, but you get the idea, spells. It was awesome and funny for me to see James pitch this because I thought, I really believed we could steal casting spells like this for the MCDM wizard or mage. Sort of the kind of thing Ars Magica implies. The fact that a card game does this tricked me into thinking we could do it, but I couldn't make it work. We already know too much about our game. Any new system has to serve the existing masters, and I couldn't get this idea to check all the boxes we needed. So I laughed out loud to see some design from this game show up, just not the design I was trying to steal. As a fan of this game, I was excited. This is a really powerful idea, I said. There was a ton of stuff we could hang on the power roll. But first, having played Epic Spell Battles, I said, the chart needs to be the same for every power and every character. I, I think James already knew that. I, I'm not sure he ever considered anything else, but it was something I noticed playing Epic Spell Battles. The chart is always one to four, five to nine, 10 plus. The results on the right are all different and idiosyncratic, but the numbers on the left are always the same. And I think I know why. It means every time somebody rolls, everyone at the table knows what the numbers on their chart says even if they can't actually read the card because they're sitting too far away. So they always know if you got a nine, everyone at the table knows you almost got the best result. That has a huge impact on play. The results on the right can and should be different and unique, but the numbers on the left of the chart should always be the same. Now, I can tell you, this is literally working. We had a play test last Friday. The people in the play test were either new or it had been months since they had played. And I watched one player say, okay, I got a seven. And another player said, wait, you got a seven? I got a trigger that will give you plus one. They knew for a fact that plus one would boost their teammates' result into the next tier because even though they had no idea what this other player was trying to do, they knew seven was just one away from the tier two result. That is really powerful, knowing for a fact that if I give you plus one to this right now, it will make a difference. And the reverse is also true. Oh, oh you got a five or a six? Well, I'll save my trigger. That is a big deal. It also helps with what we call the cognitive load. How much shit do we expect the average player to hold in their head? If every ability in the game could have unique ranges, players and directors would go insane. There'd be no real way to know, is that good? Just looking at the die roll. Now, obviously the cognitive load is even lower when it's just 2d6 and that's the damage you did. But we tried that and it led here. I can't tell you how many problems this solved. Using 2d6 as just a straight damage roll meant we had to inflate everybody's hit points up to what seemed like stupid high levels. That didn't bother us, it's all relative. Fights would play out the same way, but it sure felt weird. 
Now, folks would get used to that. There is precedent, but this lets us bring things back down to normal. As soon as I saw what James had posted, my brain started fizzing. I immediately that day prototyped the Elementalist using the new power chart. I'd already been working on the Elementalist, but this is what I needed to get really excited by it. I saw enormous possibilities for this. You could have a spell where the effect is always the same, but the chart sets the target number to resist. Or the spell always does the same damage, but the results tell you how big the area is or how many targets you affect. You could use the chart to tell you how tough the undead you summon are. You could have kits like, like a light weapon kit that does more damage when you roll badly. <laughs> That's probably a stupid idea, but maybe not. You could have magic items that add an effect to any roll of any power if you get 10 or better. Or artifacts that add like a, a fourth tier, like 13 plus to your existing powers. I can't even put all the ideas and possibilities here. There are too many. After testing this a few times with a few different people, we felt like it was working, but we knew there were challenges with this solution. It was powerful and exciting, and we thought fun, but it wasn't perfect. You, hearing this, have already thought of everything I'm about to say. A lot of people, when they hear this, they imagine looking it up is a lot more complicated than it really is. There's just three results. The numbers are always the same. You very quickly learn what the rolls mean. You know when you get a seven, you just missed tier two. After a couple of rolls, you're not actually looking up the result. You know the ranges. You're looking up the effect. And folks imagine the effects as being a lot weirder than they are. The different results are always variations on a theme. Like for the fire mage, all of these things do fire, just some fire, better than nothing, a goodly amount of fire, woohoo, and a lot of fire, and something cool happens. I think the biggest problem, the one that might actually turn some people off, is the level of abstraction. When your die roll is the damage roll, it feels visceral. I rolled an eight, I do eight damage. The die becomes a metaphor for your weapon, a very powerful metaphor. Having to translate the result means the 2d6 becomes a metaphor for your power or your skill, how well you did on the attack, and that is one level of abstraction above a straight damage die, and some people won't like this. But having already tested this with a lot of different people, some people really like this. Actually, I don't think this idea is that weird. The chart doesn't really matter. What matters is what we do with it. Now, we haven't sent this to the patrons yet. It's still with our contract testers, but folks already like how all the different results can be different, really dialed in to make different heroes feel different. Requiring every heroic ability to have a three-line chart could cause the character sheet to become unwieldy. But we have some control there. We could just reduce the number of abilities, for one thing, which seems reasonable considering each ability now has three results. As we played it, I realized what we had done. We had sort of taken the entire experience of D20 Fantasy and baked it into one roll without the null result. Two to seven is a bad turn. It's just not as bad as I miss next. Because remember, you can hit in D20 Fantasy and have a bad turn just because you rolled a one on the damage die. Here, we have precise control over what counts as a bad turn. You're always gonna make progress. The only question is how much? Are you making progress faster than the monsters? You also have a good turn result, a really good turn result, and we still have the crit on a natural 12. We started to think maybe skills should use this too. I think most people want a range of results on a skill check rather than the Boolean pass fail results. And this lets us have a range of successes for any skill roll. We've already started on that. That's it. Does that seem like a big change? Well. Yes and no. In a sense, it's a very minor change. The game still has classes and levels. It's still 2d6. Nothing else has changed. So from our point of view, it's tweaking this one tiny slice of the game, but that has major implications. So we're still testing. We've revised the entire game to use this role, and it's working really well. Everybody seems to get it. Is this the final iteration of the core die roll? It might be. We're constantly talking about tweaking it, but until we think we need to, we won't. And right now, it seems to be working. We think it's so powerful, it is now our job to make it work, file off any edges. We spend a lot of time dialing in the actual ranges. Should it be two to four? Should it be two to seven? That kind of thing. And that may get refined as we go. Should there be a fourth tier? Probably not. We might let magic items and stuff create those exceptions. Or not, if it's a bad idea. But we are committed to making this work. It worked great in our internal tests and really, it did what I always say the rules need to do. It worked and got out of the way. Maybe with like one exception across several tests, no one even commented on the chart. It just worked. People loved the results. 
In other words, this chart isn't what's gonna make this game fun. It's what we do with it. It's everything else. That's it folks, new die mechanic. Next video, probably time to talk about some more class prototypes. We'll see. Until next time, wait, the goblin box. So our friends at Trenchworks are making a big box of goblins, 20 goblins for a hundred bucks. And these are MCDM goblins. So they got prehensile feet and little snout noses, which we love. These are the goblins from Queen Bargnot's Lair from Where Evil Lives. This is a book of 22 scenarios, one for every level from second to 20th level, each featuring some awesome, unique villain. Each scenario is entirely self-contained. All the monsters you need to use it are included. This goblin box has tons of goblins, including Bargnot the guy, actually I have it right here. Bargnot the Goblin Queen, and an epic goblin war spider. You may notice some of these goblins have names and unique poses. Well, that's because the goblins in the scenario have those names. We really like the folks at Trenchwork. They've done all our minis and everyone loves them. You can get STL files of all the minis. I think there's like 20 goblins in the box right now, but if more people pledge, you unlock lots more goblins. And eventually, if they do well enough, we get a Pinna mini. Pinna is our favorite NPC. She's a hedge wizard from the adventure in Kingdoms of Warfare, and she's sort of our unofficial mascot. Everybody loves Pinna, and now she can be a mini. That's only if they do really well, and that's why I thought it would be fun to plug in a video. Next video, like I said, we'll probably talk about some more classes. I don't know, there's lots to talk about, but if you don't wanna wait, come on by the Patreon, eight bucks a month, and you get to read the entire history of the game, and you get to be one of the first people to play it. There'll be a new Patreon packet soon with the new power chart. That'll be exciting. Okay, that is actually it. Until next time, peace out.